So you have white collar and you have blue collar, but what about new collar? IBM started using that term to describe individuals from marginalized communities who may not have a college diploma, but are just as talented as their degreed counterparts. So today I'm chatting with the founder and chairwoman of the Agile Learning Institute, whose mission it is to help these new collar workers by providing free mentorship and career support to help them find work as a software engineer. So if you're coming from a non-traditional background or a career changer yourself, this new caller episode is for you. So Mike and Christina, thank you so much for joining. So to start us off, can you tell us a little bit more about the Agile Learning Institute and specifically what you do to help these new caller workers? Absolutely. The Agile Learning Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit, and our mission is to provide career coaching and mentorship to software engineers. Um, we partner with a number of different nonprofits to try and reach underrepresented people in the industry or to give a, a hand up to people that are maybe starting a new career. That's what we refer to as, as new collar workers. So we have kind of a whole class of people we serve that in particular are moving from a, a, another job into an IT career. Um, we provide coaching and mentorship services within the framework of a couple of different tools, depending on where you're at in your career. And then we kind of support four separate specialties as far as if you want to dive deeper than just generalist skills, we build T-shaped engineers. And um, that's probably worth some discussion. Well, thank you so much for all the work that you do in the community. This concept of a T-shaped developer that you're trying to build, can you expand on what that means? Um, we really focus on having some generalist exposure. So as you and I and many other people know, a lot of people don't get exposure to a lot of the different parts of the software life cycle, maybe jobs that other people do. They may learn specific skills in Python or JavaScript or a coding language, but they may not get that exposure to networking or um, how to write clean code or how to do testing or automated testing. So we really utilize a curriculum that exposes and gives them a foundation of understanding across software engineering um, that is, you know, it's not language specific, um, but it really helps them build that deeper understanding about how this industry works. And as you and I know, people coming in from boot camps or self-taught, sometimes those are the things that um, they don't have time to teach in that limited scope. Um, and those are the things that we hear often about, hey, these are the, the ideas and the concepts that need to be shored up if you're coming from a uh, non-traditional educational path. So we definitely focus on that. Not just to start them off well, but also because you don't know what area you're going to be interested in until you're exposed to it. So it helps give them and us an idea of what sh what are these paths do you think that you're really going to be well suited for as we continue in the um, apprentice program? What does that education look like? You know, is this lecture style? Is this you know more one on one project based work? You know, what does that structure look like in your program? We very much focus on a one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationship with our apprentices. We have a resource that we use that's an open source resource. Your folks can find it out on GitHub. It's called Engineer Kit. And that's what helps us build that top of the T, like Christina was saying, the broad generalist skills across the whole industry. And then we have four different recognized specialties that we help people if they want to dive deeper on learning in a particular area. Um, our program consists of a, a regular meeting and the cadence of that meeting is very much up to uh, the apprentice and how much time they have to devote and how fast they want to move through a curriculum. So we're very flexible or agile in, in that respect. We would meet with an apprentice on a regular basis and review kind of where they were at now and discuss any things that they had questions about since the last time we met, um, evaluate where they are today in their career or in their job search or in their education, where are you at right now? And what's the most important thing for us to focus on this week or this month? And we adjust that curriculum to each apprentice as we're working with them in that one-on-one -on -one relation. That sounds incredibly time intensive and incredible that you're giving that, that type of support. I feel like a lot of developers when they're going through the traditional bootcamp approach don't have that type of uh, handholding. Um, so a developer who is interested in going through your program to upskill themselves you know, what does that application process look like and what type of developer would be uh, the most successful trying to get into your program? Christina, can you speak to that? Sure. So on um, our website, Agile Learning Institute, we have a link where they can sign up. It's under join us. 
Um, so just be kind of a reach out contact and then they'll schedule a half an hour, one hour meeting with Mike or somebody else to kind of discover where they are, what their goals are, what they're interested in. Mike had alluded to the fact that our curriculum can be, um, it can meet wherever these, the applicants are. So we could have some people coming in from no experience. We could have some people coming in from after joining a boot camp. some people who um, have some experience self-learning and they just want to take the next step. So our ideal candidate is, as Mike mentioned, is somebody who has some exposure to tech. They know that they want to do it. They've shown some initiative, um, done some kind of research or, or work on their own. And then after speaking to us and deciding we may be a good fit, they continue that initiative by doing some prerequisite um, learning or, you know, little courses before we continue. So it's not a, um, a box that you have to fit because we are trying to serve a very wide array of people. Uh, but the bottom line is we're trying to serve the people who are historically not necessarily given um, exposure or a really straightforward path into tech. So it's not just the regular diversity metrics, but it could be, you know, a guy in Tennessee or Canton, North Carolina, where the mill just shut down and they need another type of job. It could be a teacher who loves teaching and, and loves what they're doing, but they can't live on, you know, $45,000 a year. It could be somebody who's what you're seeing um, and they just have a lot of passion, but they need that extra. Um, and I did want to kind of backtrack. You had made the comment about handholding. So I do want to say that our our applicants, our apprentices, people go through our program, work incredibly hard. Um, we are there with lots of support, but they take a lot of initiative. They do the work. The success is on them. Um, it's not necessarily hand-holding through the way, but we are there to be good coaches, uh, to be good coaching as a mentor and help them succeed in the ways that they need. Absolutely. Great clarification. And just to uh, yeah. make it more explicit, what you're mentioning here, uh, this is a remote program that serves mostly the U United States, uh, I assume. And then as a nonprofit, you know, what do you charge for people to go through this program? There is no fee for going through the program. And if I could add to what Christina was talking about who we serve, our real sweet spot is people that have been through code school. Um, they've been through kind of a full stack development experience and they understand what is a database, what is an API, what is a JavaScript front end, if they have just that fundamental knowledge, we take them from there to a robust software engineer. You know, you're going to have to work with a lot of different people mm -hmm. and, and getting that T-shape is what makes the difference between somebody that's just out of code school and somebody that knows how to work on a project with a team. So then you talk about this engineer kit curriculum that sounds like drives a lot of the, the, the structure. Can you talk a little more about what uh, concepts are inside that engineer kit? Absolutely. Um, Engineer Kit breaks down the domain of information technology into 15 broad categories, um, 15 modules, if you will. Um, and those modules cover everything from computer basics and hardware basics, networking, uh, craftsmanship. What does it mean to be a craftsman? Um, it talks about operations and monitoring and cloud cloud hosting providers. And it provides a list of resources across a number of different topics within each module that you can follow to become a generalist in that domain. We're not building a specialist. You're not going to read our infrastructure module and become an SRE, but you're going to read our infrastructure module and know how to work with an SRE. And that gives you a big leg up in most organizations. And then, uh, Christina, uh, in addition to this mentoring and education that, that you provide, are there any other uh, like tooling support? Like you mentioned, you know, some of these dis disenfranchised backgrounds, uh, like laptops, keyboards. Like, is there any type of like material they can get as well to kind of help get them through the program, or is it really just education based? Um, that is something we're definitely focusing on. So. As you can imagine, a lot of our participants don't have a lot of money to burn, you know, and even though we're not charging a fee to take the program, they're still committing time. And as we know, the more time they have to commit, the faster they can get it done. So we've had, um, we always need donations of MacBooks that are able to run after, you know, um, we always need donations. We're really trying to push towards being able to do a paid apprenticeship as well. So financial donations would be great um, because people still have to pay their bills in the meantime. 
And especially the target that we're going after is um, generally lower wages. So savings accounts are usually not there. Um, so anything to make that transition easier and more fair um, and to be able to help them succeed would be great. So it could be a monthly donation. It could be a one-time donation to help us cover the cost of running a nonprofit, you know, insurance, cloud services, et cetera. We absolutely take laptop donations. We can do in-person um, pickups or through the mail. Um, and we also are, you know, look for mentors. So that's if you can commit to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, we have a full training program for that. So you do need to be able to commit the time, but it's amazing, amazing training for it. And then we are um, opening up uh, volunteer roles. So if you can't necessarily do a whole mentorship, we'd love for you to come to our open source GitHub and do some peer reviews, give some feedback, uh, maybe record a resource or we're still doing those, you know, going through those, those ideas to see what's going to be most helpful for our um, participants. But yes, we We'd love for people to join in whatever way that they are available to step beside us and help us accomplish this mission, which is helping the people we serve. And we've already mentioned a, a few resources so far in this conversation about obviously the sign up link, uh, you know, engineer kit details, you know, donations here now. So I just want to mention for our listeners, uh, Christina, if I can get those from you, uh, I can make sure they're included uh, in the show notes. So people can sign up and you know, take, take next steps, even if they want to you know, donate and not necessarily sign up yeah. themselves. Um, and one last detail I'm going to throw in. So we are always looking for partners, too, as long as our missions align. So Agile Learning Institute um, has a partnership with Engineer Kit. Um, Engineer Kit is part of our curriculum, and then we add on to it as well. Amazing group, amazing people. Um, we're finalizing a partnership with Women Who Code, and there's some more partnerships coming down the line. Uh, Persevere, one of my favorite nonprofits that teach people to code while they're incarcerated without internet, which is amazing, right? <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Um, so we, you know, we, we love partners in the community because we know when we partner with other people with the same heart, um, that just grows exponentially too. So not just people and not just monetary donations, and computers, but, um, other groups that then come beside us as well. And I'll get you all that information there. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you for you know, taking us back to the, the core mission here of what the Agile Learning Institute is all about. I, I'm curious to learn about your own personal stories. As to, and to why you, know, you chose to you know, help you know, be a part of this organization and push that mission forward. So, Mike, let's start with you. you know, what is your, your why for wanting to support the community in this way? Um, okay. I've been in IT for a long time. Uh, the gray hair is well earned. I learned how to program on flashcards. Um, when I went to school, I went to uh, what was the equivalent of code school back in the day. It was DeVry Institute. And DeVry had a three-year program, and on the campus, they taught computer science and electrical engineering. That was the only two classes they had, and they had a three-year campus. And on a three-year campus with those two programs, there were three women. And all three of them were electrical engineers. None of them were in the computer science side. Throughout my career, I've witnessed the fact that women haven't been entering the field and when they do enter the field, they frequently get relegated to secondary roles. Um, the, the industry has been really bad at not accommodating diverse voices. When I was working at IBM, I uh, learned about design thinking and about the value in diversity, about the fact that diversity was not just for diversity's sake. It's not just because it's good to have people. It's actually valuable to have a diverse set of ideas walking in a room and working in a creative process. Building software is a creative process. A diverse team is going to produce better quality software and provide a better experience for the people that interact with that software. It's just a fact. And I got to a point in my career where I could do some volunteer work. I wanted to find a way to do what I could to level the playing field a little bit. To find those people that hadn't been given an opportunity, find those people that maybe had had the rug pulled out from under them or that had a learning disability that made it difficult for them to learn in a traditional setting. And um, so last year uh, I retired and founded the Agile Learning Institute, and this is now what I do full time. That's an incredible story. My father was a computer programmer, and that's why I got into uh, computer programming. And so much of the success I had in life was really just because of the household that I was born into and the experiences that I had at a young age. And uh, you know, being able to you know, recognize that privilege and then to be able to you know, work what you can to pay it forward where you can, that's an incredible story, Mike. Thank you for sharing. 
Christina, what is your why for being part of this organization? Absolutely. So um, most people who know me know that I was a late career changer, came into tech in my early 30s. Um, also very passionate about people. So I'm passionate about women in tech. I'm passionate about anybody who's the underdog, right? So yes, there's lots of systemic issues, especially here in the South, but they're everywhere. Um, and it, it's important, like Mike said, that we actually do something to address these issues and not just talk about it. Um, I had known Mike actually because when I came out of code school, I randomly messaged him and I was like, hey, can I interview you? Can you can we have lunch, like the whole coffee thing? And he said, sure, and had fabulous time. He became a friend. So we've been friends for years now. And um, what he was doing, like his heart about this and all the, the hearts of the people involved, I share that same passion. This isn't just about, you know, tick for, tick for tack and like uh, equalizing the scales of justice. It's about these are people like this is not a movement for DEI. And, you know, we have leaders declaring that DEI is dead. This is like diversity is our world. <laughs> This It just is. It's not whether it's in vogue or out of vogue. These are our people. This is us um, in one way or another. And so I love being able to do what I can, um, use my voice, use my platform, use my time and the knowledge that I have to not only be able to share technical skills, um, but be able to share advice, career advice, life advice, kind of combat those mindset issues, which we see is a huge, you know, it's it's more than half the battle is the mindset issues when you're coming from a different mind frame of life. And this um, organization is approaching this holistically. So yes, we will help you become a T-shaped engineer. Yes, you can go down one of the specialties and be an SRE or a, a data engineer or a UX expert. Um, but you, we're going to help you grow as a human. We're going to help you grow and be prepared to enter tech, tech successfully and um, like Mike said, not only is there a lack of women, but other underrepresented people coming into tech. But, you know, if we just talk about women, half the women leave within the first year or two. There's a reason for that. So we're coming beside people and helping with the whole picture and shouting really loud and clear, like, we value you as a human. This is why we're doing it. Mike is retired and wanted to do this. You know, this is Mike's your time. All the people who are mentors are doing this. Because they actually care. It's Mike does not need another resume item, you know? <laughs> and I know that everybody there is genuine, is genuine and sincere. And I see them putting the work in and I see the the fruit that's coming out of it. So why wouldn't I want to be part of this? Um, and I'm incredibly honored to be able to have, um, you know, they elected me chairwoman of the board, which is like one of my favorite things of life right now. Like what an honor to be able to uh, be the voice for that and make the change where I can. So. Yes, it's one of the, my favorite things I do, and I hope they keep me around for a long time. I hope so as well. Uh, so as we get close to the end of our episode here, I want to give each of you an opportunity to give any shout outs to any other community partners, you know, resources, uh, or even a, a final plug for your favorite part of the Agile Learning Institute uh, that we haven't covered already. Uh, so we can share those with our listeners. Uh, Mike, well, I'll, I'll look to you. I, I want to give a shout out to Persevere because they've really been um, front and center in my life for the last few weeks. Um, they have an amazing program that works with people who are incarcerated to teach them how to code. And Christina made an allusion to it, but just try to put yourself in the position of somebody who has never programmed before, doesn't know anything about computers, and you're going to learn how to code using a laptop for an hour or two a day with no access to the internet. Um, they had access to MDN and VS Code, and that was about it. Um, so the, these, these folks that have come up out of that program step in with us and we help round things out. One of the consequences of learning that environment, they had no access to GitHub. They have no idea what it's like to work with a source code repository. It's a very fundamental tool, but it's a little thing that we can pick up and help them learn very quickly so we can finish rounding things out to make them much more confident in the job market. And I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to work with the folks from Persevere. Um, they have introduced me to some of the most amazing people. Christina, what about you? Yep. I'm going to do a quick add on to Persevere. Um, like Mike said, we talk about imposter syndrome. Imagine the bravery, the courage, the perseverance that these participants for Persevere 
have, you know, you're not just battling regular imposter syndrome, but coming, saying, I'm coming out of incarceration. I'm having to do this the hard way and I'm not going to stop and I'm going to change the world, which is what all of them do and think. It's just amazing. My second shout out is uh, Women Who Code. So Women Who Code is an international organization. It's in 147 countries. Um, it's in pretty much every major city and a lot of minor cities. We do. Um, it's an organization to support women and anybody who identifies as a woman um, in the tech field. You don't have to be a developer. You can be a technical writer. You can be a product manager. You can anything in that field or even if you're just thinking about it, please come join us. You can search womenhoodcode.com. You can um, find meetups for your local area. You can join our local Women Who Code Green Book Group. We will take you no matter where you're from. Um, and it's a great space to be able to be exposed to lots of different areas, to have support. Um, and we're not exclusive. We do lots of events and uh, learnings and everything with the rest of the community. So it's a good thing, but just with that extra support, um, resources, just amazing opportunities to get for continued learning conferences. Um, to shore up your public speaking skills, all of those things that will really help you be successful and confident in yourself as a woman in tech. So that's my shout out to Omni Cohn. We're here for you. Come find us. Well, thank you so much, Christina and Mike, for joining and sharing your stories and the story of the Agile Learning Institute and those that you partner with. Hopefully that this conversation was helpful to a lot of those that are in a similar, similar stage of life or they're trying to you know, better themselves and their family. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. So I just want to thank you for joining us. And uh, for those that, those that are listening, we will see you next time. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Junior Jobs Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to like and subscribe as that helps us reach more developers in need. And don't forget to check the show notes for details on today's sponsor and other job search services that we provide.